our planet faces an unprecedented health, social and economic crisis. One that puts every nation on Earth in danger and challenges all fundamental assumptions about our world. The COVID-19 pandemic threatens to reverse decades of development progress, putting the sustainable development goals at risk. It has brutally exposed the vulnerability of developing countries and magnified the inequality that exists both within and between nations. This is the first opportunity since the pandemic began for world leaders to come together and create global solutions for trade and development. The almost 200 countries represented here have a unique opportunity to do things differently, to do things better, to make sure global trade benefits everybody equally. This is our opportunity to forge a shared destiny between developing countries and developed ones to use technology to create better productive systems, to cut carbon emissions and give our planet another chance, to put in place effective financing for development and establish a sustainable global debt system. We have the potential to give everybody the opportunity to succeed by bridging the digital divide, improving gender equality, boosting productive capacities, and investing in our youth. UNCTAD 15 is a moment for us all to act together, to employ bold new thinking to help address the biggest challenges that face the world. Together, let's create a more equitable and prosperous future for everyone. Together, let's move from inequality and vulnerability to a future of prosperity for all, because now, more than ever before, trade needs to work for everybody. Excellencies, distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our ministerial roundtable on scaling up finance for development. My name is Jonathan Wheatley. I'm the Financial Times correspondent for Emerging Markets and Development. And it's a great honor for me to be moderating this fascinating roundtable discussion. So thank you very much to my friends at UNCTAD for the invitation. I'd like to welcome all our participants in the studios in Barbados and in Geneva, uh, as well as those connecting virtually from around the world. Uh, we're extremely fortunate to have four distinguished and eminent panelists with us today. We will hear from Her Excellency Rebecca Greenspan, who's the new Secretary General of UNCTAD, We'll have Her Excellency Mia Motley, Prime Minister of Barbados and newly elected President of UNCTAD. Her Excellency Nadia Calvino, First Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Economic Affairs and Digital Transformation of Spain. His Excellency Martin Guzman, Minister of Finance of Argentina. And Mr. Joseph Stiglitz, Professor at Columbia University and Nobel Laureate in Economics. And their full biographies are available for you to see on the event site. Uh, before I give the floor to Madame Greenspan for her introductory remarks, just allow me to briefly inform you about the flow of the roundtable discussion today. Uh, after Madame Greenspan, our first panelist will be Her Excellency Mia Motley, followed by Her Excellency Nadia Calvino. And due to Her Excellency Calvino's prior commitments, we'll have our first part of the Q&A session right after her remarks. And that brief bit of questions and answers will be followed by two more speeches for the panel, and then we'll have the final part of the Q&A and brief closing thoughts from the panelists at the end of the round table. So please note that the Q&A session is strictly for questions and not for statements. And I'm afraid we will enforce this rule by cutting people off if they start making statements due to time constraints. So questions only, please. Um, and how you do that, participants uh, can already begin to submit questions for the Q&A through the Slido app. And you can find a button for the Slido app next to the bottom right-hand corner of this video feed. And when you click the Slido button, a new browser window will open. You first enter your name, please, then click on the Q&A and submit your question. And without further ado, I'm pleased to invite Madam Rebecca Greenspan, the new Secretary General of UNCTAD, to open the roundtable 
with her introductory remarks. Madam Greenspan, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Jonathan, and let me first uh, give my welcome to, to Mia Motley, dear Prime Minister, thank you so much. It has been wonderful, this uh, conference here in Barbados, and also your very strong statements towards trade and development and financing for development that is today our theme. Thank you to Vice President Nadia Calviño of Spain. Thank you, Nadia, for being with us. I know that you have a very tight schedule. To Martin Guzman of Argentina. Martin, so nice to see you here. And to the Nobel laureate Stiglitz, thank you so much. Uh, it's an honor to have you with us. I can, uh, I, this round table will focus on an immensely important matter, scaling up financing for development. But before I yield the floor to the panelists, I would like to share with you some of ANCAT's thoughts on these issues as a way of setting the stage for the debate. And although I will refer mainly to structural issues, it's impossible not to start by referring to the present health, socioeconomic, and environmental crisis, a crisis that expresses the two main challenges of our time. On the one hand, the rampant inequalities that the world is facing, and on the other hand, the inability that we have to act together. So that too, the inequalities within and between countries, and the weakening of the multilateral system are a, a, the a, a problems of our time. So, just to say a few indicators, the unequal access to vaccines, you know that uh, the developed world is vaccinated at 20 times the rate that the developing world is vaccinating. Least developed countries has only vaccinated 3% of their population, while the developed countries are already discussing the third doses for their population. The unequal access to financial resources, you know that uh, the uh, developed world has uh, put together packages of around 28% of GDP to counteract the effects and the impacts of the pandemic, while the middle income countries are around 6.5% of GDP and the least developed countries around 1.8% of GDP. The unilateral trade restrictions, value chain disruptions, and the tariff and non-tariff resources uh, measures and the high cost of transport is evidence also of what we have said. And the unequal impact on clim of climate change and the unmet target for adaptation resources promised at the Paris Agreement. This is, uh, 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 Mia Motley has been a very strong voice towards this very a, a, a unequal a situation. Let me then a, go with you to the more structural results. But we know that the strong growth that the world is a, showing right now, 5.3% average growth, really hides more than it reveals because there is a divergence in the growth with the developing, developing countries really growing at a fraction of the developed world. Uh, if we don't act collectively to address these asymmetries, these inequalities, the developing countries will not only see the loss of hard-won progress in their fight against inequality and poverty and food insecurity, but they also will face the possibility of a loss they get in a failure of the SDGs agenda and the Paris Agreement. So now, even before the, uh, uh, we have to say that even before the ongoing COVID-19 crisis, according to ANTAT, the SDG financing gap amounted to at least $2.5 trillion annually. A recent OECD report now suggests that that gap have widened to 4.2 trillion, 70% more than what we had in uh, 2020, due to the deterioration of the indicators of falling tax revenues, collapse of private external financing uh, to around 700 
a billion dollars less. Already before COVID, the total external debt stocks of developing countries reached a record high of $11.3 trillion in 2020, amounting to more than double their combined export earnings in low-income development countries and around, <coughs> sorry, 1.5 times this earning in middle-income countries. In many cases, the cost of servicing this debt is prohibited absorbing on average around 13 to 18 percent of export earnings in low and middle income countries and a staggering one third in small island developing states. Some of the reasons for that are worsening balance of payment constraints in many of our countries and thus more limited access to international liquidity in the wake of a slow global recovery since the global financial crisis. Second, the very rapid integration of even poorer developing countries into international financial markets over re recent years, including often premature capital account liberalizations that has also led to the build up of external debt burdens. Third, the limited access most developing countries have to concessional multilateral financing, thus relying on refinancing their external public debt in international bond markets. Over the remainder of this decade, many mostly middle-income countries will have to repay almost $1 trillion in such bond debt. At the same time, high expectations of the so-called blended finance, the idea that public resources should be leveraged to raise private capital for development, that is a good idea, but has not been fulfilled. By some estimates, every US dollar invested by public lenders in low-income economies has raised only 0.37 private finance. And in, in lower middle income countries, around 0.6. So, this current landscape of development finance clearly calls for urgent rethinking and reform. First and foremost, lasting solutions must be found to tackle the problem of unsustainable debt burdens in developing countries. While the G20 Common Framework is a first step forward, a more comprehensive approach will be needed. As you know, ANCAT has long called for such a more comprehensive approach. The UN Secretary General of the uh, uh, Antonio Guterres has called for the expansion of the debt service suspension and the debt restructuring and relief. Second, we should consider ways to leverage special drawing rights more systematically for developing countries, a debate that is currently, as you know, underway. We have to mitigate developing country constraints on access to international liquidity, liquidity and that will also contribute to freeing resources, uh, domestic resources for developmental objectives. However, finding a way to link more directly the SDRs to development through, for example, the development banks will be an important step forward to enhance the PRGT, the new facility that is being proposed by the IMF for climate change and resilience are very important, but we need also to link that money not only to macro, but to development too. And lastly, we need to strengthen public development finance and ensure the quality of this finance and its affordable and transparent channeling into long-term development priorities. Here again, the role of multilateral, regional and, and national development banks is key and recapitalization of these organizations is needed. So we need to make also blended finance work to mobilize and harness private capital, but it is clear at this point that weakening public finance to do this is not the right way to go. So, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, there are only some of the most pressing challenges that must be tackled to ensure uh, uh, that uh, trade 
is conducive to a better, more equal, more resilient recovery. I am, of course, aware that meeting any one of these challenges faces formidable hurdles. I am therefore all the more thankful to our distinguished panelists for joining us to discuss this important topic and greatly look forward to your invaluable thoughts and suggestions. So I yield the floor to you. Thank you. So sorry, everybody, falling into the classic mute trap there. I will try to get myself better organised. Thank you very much, Madam Greenspan, for those remarks, which set the stage very well for our for our round table. Um, a whole set of uh, complex issues for our panellists to address. I would just like to add to that. One, one thought that occurs to me is that you mentioned the access to finance by uh, rich countries and poor countries. All the, the floods of capital that were provided by the US Federal Reserve and other advanced economy central banks into global financial markets obviously was a massive help for those with access to those markets and uh, rich countries didn't need to borrow but middle income countries with access to uh, financial markets were able to borrow relatively cheaply but of course a lot of the poorer countries don't have access to that money there is a, a narrative going around that there is free money available for all and of course it, it, it isn't free for the poorer countries and many of those are being asked to pay interest rates that effectively lock them out of capital markets anyway, never mind whether the rating agencies are getting concerned or not. So that leaves us with a huge challenge of how to deal with those piles of debts that you mentioned. Um, and perhaps we can address some of that today. I'd like to move on now to the next portion of our run table uh, and invite Her Excellency Mia Motley, Prime Minister of Barbados, to deliver her remarks. Excellency, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And may I say straight off to you that it's not only poor countries that have had problems um, being able to access the markets and who are left out of the concessional funding in the DSSA, but it is also middle-income countries. Um, as I say, so let us be very clear that small island developing states have literally been the canary in the coal mine of the international economic system. And large states, we all know, are less dependent on trade than we are less dependent on travel than we are. And reality is we are hyper open. Our imports and exports are more than our GDP. We are most sensitive to the fortunes of the international system. Exclude war-torn Libya and the 20 hardest hit countries globally by the pandemic have been last year predominantly small island developing states from the Maldives and Mauritius to St. Lucia to Fiji to Dominica, Bahamas, Antigua, and to my own country, Barbados. Today, the international system, my friends, is facing its biggest test since the establishment of the Bretton Woods institutions. And why? Because today, the front line of trade dependency crosses the front line of the climate crisis. I want to repeat myself. The front line of trade dependency crosses the front line of the climate crisis. We will all be impacted adversely by the climate crisis. But there is a front line and a back line for now with the climate crisis. Scientifically, the countries most impacted by the climate crisis today on the front line of the war lie between the tropics of Cancer and the tropics of Capricorn, where the temperature increases have been the most intolerable and where the sea level rises have been the most. This combination, we all know, has fed disastrous droughts in Africa and Asia and terrible hurricanes and typhoons in the Pacific and the Caribbean. Many of the frontline chain states, you also know, are small island developing states, but we are tired saying so. So let me give you a report on the international system from this front line. And what do I have to tell you? One, it is in retreat. Two, it is being seen as irrelevant to the needs and dreams of ordinary people at best, and at worst, a playground or a battleground for big countries to jockey for relative position. 
And this is partly because the tools and mechanisms of international trade system are really out of date. We discussed this yesterday, Rebecca. To rescue the international system, we need a new trade agenda that works for the whole world. And as the incoming chair of UNCTAD, while being the outgoing chair of the World Bank IMF Development Committee, there are four things of, and five things that I want to discuss with you today. One, we know that the direction and bulk of trade is no longer crossing our airports or our seaports, but they're crossing our internet ports. And the new world trade is increasingly being driven into a few channels controlled by the technology behemoths. If you're not selling on Amazon or Alibaba or Facebook or Google or the Apple App Store or others, you're not selling. You're not reaching the market. The gateway to the world are really now through these a private oligopoly. Who else will ensure equal and fair access? Who is going to police the algorithms that channel that traffic? Who? We are witnessing the greatest privatization of trade infrastructure, and there is no regulatory framework to ensure trade and development. That's what we discussed yesterday. Today's conference, we believe, is an opportunity to shape an emerging regulatory framework for the new trade. Second, we must learn quickly from the debacle around the <laughs> distribution of the vaccines. I want to shake my head every time I say it. Where the rich world we know has secured five times more than they needed immediately out of the blocks, which then stopped those of the rest of us getting access. And this is not just morally wrong, it was foolishness on their part, pure folly. Why? Because what it did was to leave a wide, wide space for the variants and mutations to come through and to literally undermine the national suppression efforts. This pandemic, my friends, has reminded us of our interdependency and our common humanity. We are always better together. We need a global clearinghouse to distribute vaccines and other critical public goods, like the new tools for the climate crisis adaptation. And we need to develop these clearinghouses, these new institutions for the global distribution of public goods, not five years from now, but now. Thirdly, freer trade in agriculture has brought cheaper food, and an explosion of non-communicable diseases in developing countries. We need a framework around nutrition security, not just food security, but nutrition security that allows governments to promote better health without falling foul of our trade rules. And I've said that basically over and over as well because too many of our people are depending on processed foods in order to stay alive, which is then costing us more and more money in our healthcare systems. Equally, UNCTAD recognized early that trade finance and debt are inextricably linked. And while there is an international agreement on trade rules, and an increasing amount of financial flows are being determined by an informal framework of lists, lists on uncooperative jurisdictions, and on anti-money laundering and tax and what next. Lists designed to name and shame, black lists, white lists, gray lists, derived arbitrarily, where judges are jurors and where the listers never list themselves. These are the things that we deal with every day. It means that money laundering and tax avoidance centers, however, are now protected in wealthy countries that produce the lists but are never listed. <laughs> Amazing. We need a rules-based system, internationally agreed and impartially applied on the publication of lists that restrict trade and finance. What we have now, Secretary General, is a system of bullying that is not pro-internationalist, not pro-poor, nor pro-development. The other thing that we need to address is the substantial gulf between borrowing costs, and we discussed this yesterday again as one of our key agenda items in the next four years. The borrowing costs between developed and developing countries, even where their fiscal fundamentals are similar. And I referred to Greece and Ghana as the perfect example. In that regard, we need to look at innovative ways for developing countries to create safe assets 
that will allow them to borrow as cheaply as the narrow group of countries that the chairman spoke about who have the benefit of the quantitative easing, but that and who also issue their assets used as reserve assets around the world today that all of us participate in actually and still end up causing us to pay a higher cost of capital even though it is our investments in their safe assets that allow them to borrow cheaper. The bottom line is that these things are disturbing and if we also want to help create space, fiscal space for developing countries especially those who invest heavily for the climate and must invest heavily, as the Secretary General of the United Nations has recognized, for the climate crisis adaptation, then we would need to relook at the rigid use of the debt to GDP, 60% fiscal anchor, as we discussed yesterday too, as to whether that can continue to be the threshold for debt sustainability. The truth is, we may well want to look at green debt and COVID debt as discussed again, with super long maturities, low interest rates, almost idle-like terms, if we are going to ensure that we can, one, meet our commitments to be able to reduce carbon, recognizing that in many instances green debt is going to have to be incurred, but equally remove from us the restriction and constraint that will be placed on us because of the increased debt that we have as a result of the COVID pandemic, which has led, um, which has been ex exponential largely because of reduced revenues, but exploding expenditures to save lives. As the Secretary General of the United Nations said in this room on Monday morning, we are either going to find ourselves servicing debt or servicing people. And we have to make the choices, but we need the technical work done to see what is fiscally sustainable. We're not recommending recklessness or irresponsibility, but we are recommending a review in the same way that we pointed out that it was the British government who was able to issue bonds, absolutely long-term um, bonds in perpetuity, recognizing that they could not finance the reconstruction post-war if they had to service the debt raised during the war. So my friends, where are we? We need a new world, trading in new ways. We need a new trade agenda, Rebecca, one that is fair and level, yet supports development. And without that, the international system, regrettably, will become irrelevant to our people. It will break down, and the consequences will be severe. Because if it does, we all know that peace will be the first casualty. And we've already seen evidence of that, regrettably, around the world, where coups, coups d'etat, which we thought were a thing of the past, have raised their heads, regrettably, in Africa. And the instability of the rest of the world is likely to be able to talk. Peter Okweche, yesterday, or day before, made a point about the literal reduction of the size of the lake in northeastern Nigeria that borders three other countries and that 95% of the water or 93% of the water in that lake since 1960 has gone and it has affected the capacity of the people in that northeastern part of Nigeria to live. It is not coincidental that Boko Haram have therefore found a very fertile ground from which to draw membership. A word to the wise is sufficient. I hope over the course of the next three years, UNCTAD can play that role in helping to change these issues. But in the interim, that our colleagues like the Minister of Finance from Argentina and the academics like Mr. Stiglitz, that we can force the issue on some of these critical points for small island developing states to survive. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for those remarks. Uh, good to hear some solid practical proposals there, but also some ringing true, some rather uh, dire warnings about the state of the world and the state of international cooperation as we're seeing it unfold during the pandemic. Uh, I would now like to invite Her Excellency, Ms. Nadia Calvino,
first Deputy Prime Minister, Minister of Economic Affairs and Digital Transformation of Spain, to deliver her remarks. Um, uh, uh, Ms. Calvino has uh, to leave straight after this, I'm afraid. We've run, slightly run over time, so we won't be going to questions and answers immediately after this. We'll save that for later. But uh, for now, Your Excellency, thank you very much. You have the floor. Well, thank you very much. And I'm, I'm extremely, uh, you know, sad that I cannot participate in this debate uh, for a longer time. And I would very much have liked to stay for the Q&A. But unfortunately, I have an, a, a commitment in, in the Parliament and I have therefore no option but to run out as soon as I finish with uh, delivering my, my initial remarks. I will try to keep it very short anyway after the very, uh, very insightful and, and provocative presentations that we just heard. I'm going to uh, turn to Spanish uh, in order to profit from it being one of the official languages of, of UNCTAD. Así que voy a empezar agradeciendo de todo corazón a Rebeca Greenspan, Greenspan la, la invitación a esta mesa redonda. Aprovecho para felicitarla por su nombramiento dentro de la UNCTAD y además me parece que es un momento tremendamente oportuno para este debate y para tratar todas las cuestiones que esas dos mujeres formidables que tenemos en la pantalla eh, han puesto sobre la mesa y que me parecen eh, todas ellas muy pertinentes, eh, claves para decidir qué futuro es el que queremos construir eh, cuando eh, consigamos finalmente salir de la situación generada por la pandemia. Como no hay mucho tiempo, he pensado eh, tratar brevemente tres puntos complementarios de los que hemos escuchado y voy a tratar de empezar con un tono un poco más positivo que el que nos ha quedado eh, tras la, la eh, intervención de la primera ministra de Barbados. Y yo creo que el primer punto que quiero poner en valor es el balance de la respuesta global que se ha dado a la crisis sanitaria generada por la COVID-19. ¿no? Eh, tenemos que hacer ese balance positivo, sobre todo comparando con lo que sucedió en la anterior crisis financiera. Eh, gracias a las medidas que se han adoptado, hemos evitado que la crisis sanitaria se convirtiera en una crisis financiera de ámbito global. Todavía queda mucho camino por recorrer, pero creo que hemos aprendido mucho sobre el significado de la palabra solidaridad en la respuesta a, a esta crisis. Es cierto que esta respuesta ha supuesto un salto muy importante en las ratios de deuda pública de todo el mundo. Eh, el impacto es, por supuesto, muy superior en los países más pequeños, en los países más vulnerables, como se acaba de señalar, pero incluso en un país grande y, y rico como España eh, hemos tenido que emitir 150.000 millones de euros adicionales de deuda pública entre 2020 y 2021 y eso supone un reto muy importante de cara al futuro. Eh, tenemos el reto de cómo salir de esta situación excepcional sin poner en riesgo la estabilidad financiera internacional eh, y, sobre todo, eh, garantizando una salida que sea lo menos desigual posible, teniendo en cuenta que las eh, posiciones de partida de los distintos países son muy diferentes y que el impacto que tendría sobre la economía de estos países el cambio de política monetaria, lo ha, se acaba de señalar, ¿no? eh, puede, puede ser también tremendamente desigual. El segundo punto que me gustaría aprovechar para compartir hoy es el compromiso de España con este plano sanitario, en el plano económico y en el plano financiero. Eh, la verdad que en el plano sanitario creo que eh, las llamadas que hemos escuchado esta mañana a eh, ver y a tratar de encontrar una respuesta global a la distribución de vacunas eh, me parece mm, tremendamente oportuna también, porque la experiencia de España, nosotros tenemos eh, casi un 80% de la población total ya vacunada, eh, cerca del 90% de la población en edad de vacunación mayores de 12 años ya vacunada. España es el país grande del mundo más avanzado en términos de vacunación. Y la experiencia que tenemos es que vacunación es recuperación que salud y economía van de la mano y que, por tanto, si queremos una recuperación económica fuerte, tenemos que lograr eh, la distribución de las vacunas en todo el mundo. No estaremos seguros hasta que toda la población esté vacunada. En este sentido, eh, hemos apoyado muy decididamente todas las iniciativas globales. Eh, saben que España tiene un compromiso especial, además, de donación de vacunas con los países hermanos de, de América Latina. 
hemos transferido ya 9 millones de vacunas eh, al mundo iberoamericano y creo que tenemos que seguir avanzando en esta dirección con donación y con venta de vacunas para garantizar que eh, damos una respuesta sanitaria eficaz. Lo mismo ocurre con los instrumentos financieros y creo que hay que ampliar también el concepto de vulnerabilidad. Como estaba señalando la primera ministra hace un momento, eh, no solo son los países más pobres, son también los países de renta media los que se pueden encontrar en una situación de desventaja en la salida de la crisis. Eh, tercer y último punto, hay que apoyarse en el marco multilateral. Está claro que juntos somos más fuertes. Tenemos que dar también una respuesta solidaria en el ámbito financiero. España también es uno de los países que dentro de nuestras capacidades hemos tratado de ser eh, lo más activos posibles en el ámbito de la conversión de deuda con 27 programas actualmente en vigor y un esfuerzo importante desde el punto de vista fiscal para, para, nuestro, para nuestro país. Hemos apoyado las iniciativas de emisión de derechos especiales de, de giro por parte del Fondo Monetario Internacional, las iniciativas de moratoria del Club de París. Creo que también tenemos que hacer el uso más eficaz posible de estos derechos especiales de giro, asegurándonos de que llegan allí donde son necesarios y apoyamos la creación de un nuevo instrumento en el Fondo Monetario Internacional para financiar políticas de transformación como la climática, mediante inversiones y reformas en todos los países, incluyendo los países de actividad del fondo, incluyendo los países de renta media. Creo que la coordinación entre las instituciones financieras multilaterales es absolutamente clave para lograr los objetivos que queremos para el futuro. Y termino justo con esta idea. Creo que es muy oportuno que tengamos este debate en la UNCTAD, como también hay que implicar la OMC, la Organización Mundial del Comercio, y el resto de instituciones multilaterales. Porque eh, no se trata solo del impacto de la pandemia en el plano sanitario, también el impacto que está teniendo sobre las cadenas de valor globales, la, el recorte y el cambio, la transformación que se va a producir en, en las cadenas de valor globales. Tenemos que dar también una respuesta global al reto climático. Tenemos que dar una respuesta global al reto de las grandes plataformas digitales, un tema muy importante que se acaba de tratar, el acceso a esos mercados nuevos que están eh, controlados por las grandes plataformas. Son muchas las cuestiones que tienen una dimensión global y que requieren de una respuesta global. Por eso creo que es importante el debate que está teniendo lugar aquí en la UNTAD y, desde luego, el mensaje que quiero dejar en nombre de España es que nosotros apoyamos las respuestas multilaterales, queremos reforzar ese marco multilateral porque es la única respuesta eficaz a los retos a los que nos enfrentamos, en los que, como ciudadanos, como líderes, como seres humanos, estamos en el mismo barco. Muchas gracias y, y les deseo lo mejor en el resto de la jornada. Mr. Mr. Calvino, thank you very much indeed for that. And we're seeing, I think, a theme developing, aren't we, of the need for a coordinated multilateral response, but also the size of the challenges ahead of us, especially the need to address the unequal distribution and delivery of vaccines around the world. Uh, no doubt we'll be hearing more about that as we go on. Uh, uh, as I said before, we will save questions and answers until the end. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Calvino, for making the time to talk to us. Uh, and I would now like to invite uh, Mr. Martin Guzman, Minister of Finance of Argentina, to take the floor to deliver his remarks. Excellency Guzman, you have the floor, sir. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, good morning or good afternoon. As Secretary General, Rebecca Greenspan. Good morning, Rebecca. Uh, Prime Minister Motley and, and Mr. Calvino, thank you very much for your enriching and, and thoughtful speeches. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to be in this panel uh, and I'm going to focus my remarks on the issue of sovereign debt crisis resolution, which is a very important issue for, for a large number of countries, uh, low income, middle income economies, and it's going to be an increasingly relevant matter in the years to come. Um, we, we know that uh, unsustainable debt burdens uh, prevent countries from establishing paths of economic recovery. They uh, create destabilizing economic and social dynamics 
And when a country faces an unsustainable debt burden, uh, it needs to resolve uh, that problem. And uh, typically that requires a, a debt restructuring process. Uh, last year in 2020, uh, I led uh, from Argentina a, a sovereign debt restructuring. So I can uh, speak uh, directly from my experience, but also in light of the empirical evidence on what's been happening on debt restructuring processes uh, to what are the challenges that countries face in the context of the current landscape, the international financial architecture that uh, today the world exhibits. And the, the situation is not good. Uh, most countries, when they conduct sovereign debt restructurings, uh, do not obtain the necessary debt relief uh, as to restore debt sustainability. M uh, most debt restructurings come in the form of too little and too late, meaning that uh, the restructuring processes get too delayed. Uh, and once they are finally uh, performed, uh, generally, they are insufficient as to give uh, the countries and the governments the resources and the conditions as to implement the public policies that are necessary for economic recovery. And what we typically see is more suffering, unemployment increasing, inequality increasing, poverty increasing, and economic, economic activity falling. Why does this happen? To a large extent, uh, because of the deficiencies that we observe in the international financial architecture. Uh, I would say that the main problem is that there is a large imbalance of power between uh, debtors and creditors. Uh, and there are also large informational asymmetries. Uh, this is something that we from Argentina face. The creditors know much more about the debtor than the debtor knows about the creditors. For instance, debtors do not know whether creditors are hedged through uh, credit default swaps, which alter their incentives at the time of sitting at the negotiating table. Also, uh, and this is something that we also face in Argentina, debtors uh, don't always know, don't know uh, what are the different holdings of creditors. So when a debtor sits at the negotiating table with creditors, it, the debtor actually doesn't know uh, who are the creditors or how much of the debt uh, is held by each of them. Uh, basically, this creates an opaque and non-transparent uh, bargaining environment, a negotiating environment. Typically, creditors are opaque and, and non-transparent. It is interesting that uh, in much of the global debate, there are calls for, for transparency about the data on the side of the debtor, but we don't see the same calls about creditors, although uh, the landscape that we face is one in which the, the massive lack of transparency and opaqueness is on the side of the creditors. And the same with imbalances of power. Creditors have tools uh, and resources to actually create uh, an environment that leads to these problems of too little and too late. And most of the countries do not have the capacity to fight in the way that is necessary in order to uh, achieve a, a, an effective resolution to sovereign debt crisis. Uh, Argentina's capacity uh, was uh, not common uh, with respect to what we generally face in the process of sovereign debt restructuring. So we clearly need reforms. Uh, one positive reform over the last uh, few years, especially in 2014, was the adoption of modern collective action clauses that uh, make the, the sovereign debt crisis resolution more effective. But collective action clauses are not enough. Uh, we see a collusive behavior on the side of the creditors in sovereign debt restructuring process when it comes to blocking a, an effective restructuring. Although we do not see the same collusive behavior of, or the same la a kind of coordination when it comes to uh, accepting uh, an offer from a debtor that is based on a proper debt sustainability analysis. So we need more than collective action clauses. What do we need? We need first um, a better multilateralism. Uh, some of us, uh, Professor Stiglitz, uh, the one that has been leading uh, uh, the, the, this process, has been calling for uh, reforms, the creation of a multinational mechanism 
for sovereign debt restructuring that is based on sound principles, uh, in departing from the principle of debt sustainability, but also including principles as transparency, uh, fair, fair treatment of the different creditors. And this will serve to restore, to create a better balance of power among creditors and, and debtors. This is something very necessary. Uh, the United Nations General Assembly approved two resolutions in two, 2014 and 2015 uh, in order to establish a process to create such a mechanism and the efforts in that direction should be deepened. Second, uh, we need uh, um, an enhanced role uh, for some institutions for the issue of debt sustainability analysis. And let me tell you here what's been happening over the last, few, uh, last decades and what happened in the case of Argentina. Typically, it's the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, who performs debt sustainability analysis. Uh, these uh, debt sustainability analysis serve as anchors for the negotiations between debtors and creditors. Most of these debt sustainability analysis for the IMF, from the IMF over the last few decades, uh, have not been uh, unbiased. They have not been based on sound evidence and theory. But the case of Argentina was different. There was a fair debt sustainability analysis performed by the IMF in the case of Argentina's restructuring in 2020, which, by the way, received massive attacks from the creditors. Uh, while in that case, we did rely uh, on good leadership on the IMF side, this is not assured uh, generally, and it hasn't happened uh, for decades in the past. I think and um, we think uh, there should be a larger role for UNCTAD. UNCTAD could be an institution that could provide unbiased, fair debt sustainability analysis based on some evidence and some theory that could help uh, to have negotiation processes that uh, are more sound. These are all elements that will help to uh, deal with the problems of too little and too late uh, on the side of the restructuring of uh, debt held by private creditors. There is more that, that can be done in order to have a, a better international financial architecture and there are at least two elements that are currently being discussed uh, at the G20 and that also involve the International Monetary Fund. Uh, one of them has to do with the surcharges. Uh, interestingly, the IMF uh, imposes surcharges when countries borrow above certain threshold, above their quota. Uh, this means that uh, there is a contradiction between the preferred creditor status of the IMF, which is supposed to lend at a, without risk of default, and the, the structure of interest rates that is set uh, at the time the IMF lends. Uh, this is something that is being discussed. And again, opaqueness is not only a problem for the bargaining the negotiation with private creditors. It's also a problem when it comes to discussing the reviews of policies at the international financial institutions. There should be a more transparent uh, discussion at the international level with open positions and, and clear positions from the different countries about the virtues or, or deficiencies of the different policies, like in this case, the policy of the surcharges, which is regressive, procyclical, and penalizes especially middle income economies. And the second element that was mentioned by Mr. Calvino that is being discussed today at the, at the G20 has to do with the creation of a new facility at the IMF, a, a resilience and sustainability trust. This is an idea that has been pushed by, by Kristalina Georgieva, uh, which we consider to be a very positive one because it would allow countries to borrow at longer terms and lower rates in order to implement reforms uh, in the productive structures to deal with the problems of climate change and also with the problems of the pandemic. And it is necessary to deal with these problems, not just because of developmental issues, but also in order to ensure the stability of the balance of payments, because countries that do not manage to transform their, their productive structures in the years to come, as to adapt them to mediate the problems of climate change, will have problems uh, to compete at, at the global level. 
We've seen good leadership uh, over the last year also at the IMF. And we, when we see what happened with the issuance of a special drawing rights, that means good leadership. When we see uh, the, the leadership of the IMF trying to review the, the surcharges policy, that is also good leadership. Uh, and the idea of creating a resilience and sustainability trust uh, in order to, to have a better performing global economy, that is also good leadership. Uh, we are now living through uh, times that are uh, difficult and in which there are powerful actors that are not showing the same kind of leadership and they are creating disputes of power that could, uh, could, could actually create damage to multilateralism. So we are at a point of possible bifurcations. Uh, we could make things better or we could make things worse. Uh, and in order to make things to better to go the right way, we, we should work collectively. Uh, and it is very important at these times that we work that way to, to build a better multilateralism for a more sustainable global economy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Excellency Guzman. And again, some uh, very practical suggestions in there, particularly uh, a call for UNCTAD to get involved in debt sustainability analysis. Perhaps we can talk a bit more about that as we go through. Uh, but I would now like to move straight on and invite Professor Joseph Stiglitz to deliver his remarks. So Prof Stiglitz, you have the floor, please. Well, thank you very much. And thank you for the opportunity to share some of my views on these issues. Uh, I was asked to talk about the quality of the coordinated pandemic response from the multilateral institutions and uh, the global, global leadership uh, of the organizations. And in many ways, my remarks will follow uh, on naturally from Minister Guzman's remarks. Uh, my view is that the international organizations, the multilateral organizations, actually responded uh, in a very impressive way. But what they can do is constrained by what the countries uh, that lie behind them are willing to do. And the leadership of the organizations uh, was actually very impressive. Unfortunately, the leadership in some of the key countries has not been. And uh, that has impeded uh, our ability to address uh, some of the key issues that we face, not only during the pandemic, but we're likely to face going forward. So let me uh, put this in perspective. Um, I think as we, uh, this echoes what, what has been said a little bit earlier, um, there was an impressive coordinated response to the pandemic, uh, which the pandemic in some ways was more complex uh, than the financial crisis of 2008. Uh, the financial crisis involved a financial shock, um, but it was not both a financial shock and a health shock. It was, uh, the pandemic was both, uh, uh, had impacts on both demand and on supply. In the case of uh, the uh, 2008 financial crisis, uh, the G20 uh, was created uh, to help uh, coordinate that. Uh, Gordon Brown, uh, uh, Prime Minister of the UK, uh, took a lead uh, in, in developing that response. And it's worth noting that it was not the United States that was at the center of uh, 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 focusing attention on what needed to be done. This time, uh, it was the IMF, the WHO, because of the health, uh, and uh, a whole variety of other multilateral institutions. Uh, in the area of economics, as Minister Guzman pointed out, it was the head of uh, the IMF that took a lead role, Kristalina Georgieva, uh, both in focusing on the finance for health, and on focusing on the economic aftermath. Uh, critical here uh, was the uh, issuance of $650 billion of uh, special drawing rights. Uh, interestingly, opposed by the United States. And that 
uh, uh, illustrates that even if you have good leadership uh, at these multilateral institutions, they can't succeed without the support of the member countries. Um, President Trump uh, and even some within the financial community uh, oppose uh, this issuance, quite frankly, for absolutely no valid reason. Civil society played an important role in uh, pushing for in, in having the United States uh, change its position. Um, and so this is an example of a real success of the multilateral institutions because there was uh, this issuance of $650 billion. Uh, there's been a slowness in establishing the facility to recycle. Uh, the Minister Guzman referred to the importance of those kinds of uh, facilities within the IMF to deal with the long-term issues of climate change and development and resilience. Um, I think something more is needed going forward. What is needed is an annual emission for global public goods, for the emerging markets in developing countries, uh, 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 more funding for climate uh, change. Uh, this is problem is not going to go away and we need the emerging markets, developing countries need sustained uh, support. And within the House of Representatives uh, in the United States, uh, uh, the Democrats have expressed strong support for that kind of expanded uh, uh, provision of SDRs. Uh, at the center of the pandemic, of course, was health. Governments, including the United States, played a key role in getting vaccine. Uh, at, within the global community, uh, this time it was the scholars, uh, the researchers all over the world where cooperation was most evident. Unfortunately, within many of the advanced countries, and this has already been alluded to, there was vaccine hoarding and hoarding of other uh, health supplies uh, with, as it was mentioned, uh, some of the banks countries uh, uh, keeping five times uh, the number of vaccines uh, relative to their population, while those in less developed countries, uh, emerging markets, uh, uh, had vast uh, shortages uh, of this. Um, the WTO, another international organization, played a key role in pushing for access to the intellectual property uh, that would enable increased production of vaccines. Uh, it's a real achievement of modern science that we could produce the vaccine in such short time, but it's a real failure of our market economies and our legal frameworks that we didn't ramp up the production in the way that would have protected the entire world and uh, as uh, was already pointed out, it was foolish, foolish for the banks countries uh, not to make that a first order commitment because as long as the disease festers in some place of the world, there is uh, scope for, mu for mutations. So the WTO uh, pushed this, but unfortunately today, Germany and a few other countries have resisted that. Uh, if the vaccine uh, IPR waiver had been adopted when it was first proposed in South Africa uh, in, in October by South Africa and India, we would be in a much better position today. There's an interesting uh, legacy that's related to the agenda of UNCTAD. Um, it shows uh, what's happened in, in, with respect to the production of the vaccine has uh, uh, shown the importance of government industrial policy and the importance of government in managing uh, risk. Uh, in some ways, you can see this as another nail in the coffin of neoliberalism, um, which uh, denied the important role of collective action. Uh, the other issue uh, it, with respect to finance has already been talked about by Minister Guzman, and that's the issue of debt. 
And uh, because he's covered that uh, uh, very well, uh, I don't think I, I uh, uh, will have uh, I'll, 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 I'll limit my remarks simply to say that the debt stay that has been uh, uh, put forward is insufficient. Uh, as the pandemic has gone on now almost two years, uh, what is needed is a deep and timely uh, and comprehensive uh, restructuring. And uh, the uh, initiative taken in the UN, um, uh, the adoption of principles for a global framework for debt restructuring in 2014 and 15 uh, is welcome. But again, it was a few creditor countries, just a few, who opposed it and have provided an impediment to the creation of that kind of framework that would enable the world to respond uh, to uh, the uh, clear overburden of, of debt. Um, again, let me echo what Minister uh, uh, Guzman emphasized. Uh, in the meanwhile, there is a need for a better framework, uh, not only for debt restructuring, but for dealing with the problem of surcharges, a better framework for uh, debt sustainability analysis. Uh, in conclusion, conclusion, I want to mention two uh, important issues. Uh, one of them, this week, uh, there is likely to be a conclusion of uh, the agreement on taxation for multilateral corporations. That's important as part of the global system of financing for development. Uh, the uh, developing countries have opened up their markets to multilateral corporations, but we haven't developed a global framework for them to be able to raise the taxes uh, that correspond to the economic activities that occur within their countries. And uh, we, the result of this is that they are not getting a, a fair share of the revenues generated by the economic activities that occur within their countries. From what I gather uh, is likely to emerge later this week, uh, that tax, international tax agreement will be inadequate. Uh, it will be a tax agreement by and for the advanced countries. And the developing countries and emerging markets will uh, almost surely go along with the agreement uh, by and large, but it will not be a good agreement. It will not redistribute uh, tax revenues uh, in a fair way, and it will not increase substantially the tax revenues that developing countries and emerging markets uh, need. And finally, I want to uh, highlight the need to create some new institutions to address the problem of finance for climate. Uh, when the Bretton Woods institutions were founded in 1944, uh, the issue of climate change was not on the agenda. Uh, climate change presents uh, challenges for uh, uh, the flow of funds, but also uh, presents challenges for risk mitigation. Um, I think a new climate institution, a global climate institution, could both uh, manage risk better, catalyze projects, uh, and in that way, uh, help uh, uh, facilitate uh, a significant increase in the flow of funds that would help uh, uh, the emerging markets, uh, developing countries face uh, climate change, which as we've already heard, is going to have a much greater impact on uh, emerging markets and developing countries, uh, which lie disproportionately in those parts of the world most affected uh, by it. Thank you.
Professor Stiglitz, thank you very much for that. Plenty uh, to uh, discuss further in there. Uh, I would like to uh, encourage people to ask any questions from the floor in Geneva or Barbados and indeed over Sligo. And a quick reminder, uh, if you want to, Slido, I'm sorry, not Slido, Slido. If you want to use the Slido button, look for the, the, the app down to the bottom right hand corner of the video feed, uh, click on that and then you'll be able to put in your name and your question. But while we're waiting for that, I mean, a number of issues that were raised there that, that, that have me wanting to ask uh, questions. Uh, perhaps the first one, um, I'd like to come maybe to um, debt relief a bit later on, but could I ask each of the panelists something on the special drawing rights from the IMF? Um, that was a, a huge chunk of money that goes in proportion to each uh, member of the IMF's share of the global economy, roughly. So the big countries get a lot, the poor countries get less. And we've heard a lot about how those can be reallocated. But one of the snags that we run up against when we look at how to reallocate them is that when they're, when they're issued, first allocated, they come with no strings attached. They are unconditional cash, virtually. Uh, but if they were to be channeled through um, IMF lending, for example, they would then come with conditionality attached, which for a lot of people would undermine the whole point of doing them that way in the first place. So could I ask um, each of you in turn, uh, Prime Minister Motley maybe first, to say how you think that could be made to work? Um, this is how what can work, sorry, I just got distracted there how we can uh, get reallocation of SDRs to work while retaining okay. their, uh, the lack of that would be attached okay. if they were lent on through the IMF, for example. Okay, I know that the IMF is looking at the sustainability and resilience trust, and that will help in part. But like um, Rebecca, I also believe that we need to ensure that some of it goes to the regional development banks um, because we do need some access to development funding, particularly to rebuild after the last year. I'm not sure that people understand the extent to which our economies as SIDS have taken a hit. Um, to have a 17% decline last year in Barbados effectively has taken me back to GDP levels that should have been there a decade ago, and in real terms, probably two decades ago. So that we are going to need, yes, stabilization, but and that can come from the um, that can come from the whole question of the resilience trust and sustainability trust. But we also really genuinely need some development funds in order to be able to allow us to do the adaptation that is so critical. The world is not going to make the 1.5 degrees, regrettably, um, and if it doesn't then we need to be able to ensure that not just only the money that comes, um, if they raise the 100 billion, that we can have 50% in adaptation, but we also need to ensure that the development banks are in to being able to do a significant amount of green lending for us to beat the clock, which can be anywhere between 12 to 20 years for small island developing states in terms of the worst of the climate impact starting to happen. Thanks very much. Uh, Minister Guzman, can I come to you? Do, you? do you think, do you have hopes that it will be possible to reallocate the SDRs? Thank you, Jonathan. Well, we certainly hope so. And this will require, uh, as we discussed before, uh, good leadership. We, we are seeing good leadership today. It, it will require the support of, of the advanced economies. Uh, and we hope uh, people uh, and leaders are up to the circumstances. Uh, I agree, I fully agree with, with Prime Minister Modley. So there are basically two, two main ways of reallocating the special growing rights that we think could work. The first one is the Resilience and Sustainability Trust that, that Mr. Jeva uh, has proposed, and it has gathered the support of, of a number of countries already. Uh, of course, the, the conditions uh, attached to the, to the loans that would be based on this trust uh, should be based on a completely different conceptual framework. Uh, with respect to uh, the the condition, the, the framework on which uh, the conditions of the loans in the past have been based. Uh, the um, typical framework 
is one in which any uh, intervention of the state creates frictions and therefore the, the IMF programs have come with conditionalities as labor reform uh, or, or trade liberalization, financial liberalization. None of them have really worked. Uh, on the contrary, they, they have made for a more unstable world, especially in the developing side of the world. Uh, now what we're discussing here is a different problems, different challenges, dealing with climate change, dealing with the pandemic, uh, and uh, funds allocated to implementing uh, productive transformations in order to have a more sustainable uh, economy uh, will certainly be beneficial. Uh, I, the, the idea of uh, reallocating some of these uh, special loan rights to regional development banks will, will certainly help because regional development banks are closer to the realities of the countries that are facing some of these problems or some of the countries that are facing these problems. Uh, they have also a, a better capacity to uh, execute and, and to bring solutions to be more in a more direct relationship with the countries that should receive these funds. Uh, finally, uh, it, it is clear that the, the asymmetries we face in terms of financing today are not just between the low income economies and advanced economies, but also uh, among the middle income economies and advanced economies. This was something that uh, was uh, emphasized by, by Minister Calvino in her presentation. Uh, the, the relocation of special government rights should also benefit the middle income economies. Thanks very much. Professor Stiglitz, do you, do you think it is important that the unconditionality should be maintained or should they be lent on as part of the, the existing structures that we have? Well, I think they have to change. Uh, I don't find there, uh, it disturbing that there be some kinds of conditionality, that this is money uh, that would go for incremental spending on climate change, climate mitigation. That's a global public good. And uh, the global community uh, has, I think, a right to say, if we're going to give money, uh, we want that money to go to advance uh, uh, the, something that is of concern to the entire community. Uh, there's been an, an agreement to provide $100 billion a year for adaptation for the country's small island states that will be very badly affected by climate change. But the advanced countries have not been able to come up with that money. So I think one can think about this uh, as money going for both adaptation and mitigation. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, we have a question coming in from the floor, but just as it's coming in, let me just ask one other question myself. If we, oh, I'm so sorry, Secretary General, go right ahead. Yeah, sorry, I was not supposed to intervene, but let me. <laughs> I, I am. I think that is the sustainable, the sustainability and resilience facility is very important, and it will include middle-income countries. But uh, my problem is that our countries, the developing world, will have to rebuild the health system. We'll have to invest in education. We have uh, an emergency in terms of the kids and, and young outside schools and high schools. And that will have very important impact for the future. So it's true that it's very important the resilience, the adaptation, the sustainability to climate change. But the problem is that the impact of the pandemic has very immediate consequences. And my problem is that uh, that has to come from the development banks, where that money for the investment in health, in social protection, in education will come from. And that's why we think that the link to the development banks is very important. And my second point is that still uh, uh, there is like a stigma going to the, to the IMF. If all the SDRs uh, 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 voluntarily given by the countries that have received them and don't need them will go only to the IMF, I am afraid that many countries won't go to the IMF precisely because of the conditionality. And one, one, one example was the PRGT, yes, where, where not a lot was given precisely because countries don't want to go to the PRGT and have at the same time the, con the conditionality of a normal a, a, a IMF program. So if 
you will have to link a normal program with the IMF to the PRGT or the sustainability and resilience. So my problem is that you will be able, uh, the countries that will go to, to ask for that money will be much less than if uh, an important effort was, was made to link it to the development banks. So uh, that there should be a combination and we are not seeing that happening. Yes. I uh, saw some figures today showing that even among the in-scope countries on the G20's debt service suspension initiative, the amount of uh, payments that have actually been suspended is only about a quarter of the of the total amount of payments that those countries have to make during the period. Um, one of the problems that struck me when I was uh, first writing about recovering this story from the very beginning was, as has been said a great many times, the lack of participation by all the actors, the multilateral institutions on one hand and at the other end of the scale, the private sector. But right from the very beginning, countries who were joining up to the DSSI, uh, I remember one of the first adherents telling me, look, we will do this as long as we are not required to ask the same terms as from bilaterals uh, of our private sector creditors because we don't want to get downgraded. So. And, and if that is imposed as a condition, we will just drop out of the DSSI. So how do you get around that? And a related question to that is, do we need some other system other than the rating agencies that we have? Um, maybe I can come to Minister Guzman first of all on that one. Thank you, Jonathan. This is, of course, a great question. Uh, the, the debt service suspension initiative, uh, it helps, but it's not sufficient, it's far from being sufficient. Uh, and it's associated with incentives problems uh, that create political economy problems as the one you just described, uh, created by the role of rating agencies. Uh, I will first say that uh, I'm from the viewpoint of, a, um, from the position of a policymaker, uh, that it is very important uh, for those that are in charge of resolving that crisis to be firmly committed to defending the interests of the people. Uh, and when a debt burden is unsustainable, it just needs to be uh, restructured. It, it, we shouldn't be paying so much attention to the voices of uh, financial players when they lobby again, restructurings, uh, uh, trying to instill fear on policymakers that if they go through a debt restructuring or if they initiate the debt restructuring, things are gonna get worse. Uh, things actually get worse if the debt restructuring is not performed when it's needed. Uh, of course, there is uh, an important, it's very important to, to revise uh, the entire international financial architecture. We haven't spoken before about the credit rating agencies, but, but uh, they uh, play a role that leads to a pro cyclicality uh, in, in terms of uh, the, the debt dynamics. Uh, and this is something that uh, should be addressed uh, in the large scope of reforms that international financial architecture requires. Prime Minister Motley, would you like to uh, respond to that? Um, I do believe that Minister Guzman is absolutely correct, and I speak from the experience of Barbados with respect to our own debt restructuring. Um, we came into office, and within one week of coming into office, we said, look, this debt was unsustainable, we're suspending it, we're spending 68 cents in a dollar in servicing debt, and we can't service the people if we have to service the debt. Um, within less than 18 months, we were able to complete both domestic and international debt restructuring. And quite frankly, had we not done it, God knows where we would be in this COVID pandemic, because within one month of completing the debt restructuring, the pandemic came and we lost 600 million, which was roughly about just under 30% of government's revenue last year. Our decline was about a billion US, just under, um, just about 17%, 18% of GDP. And quite frankly, um, if we had not done it, I don't know where we would be. So that this notion that you don't want to, or you are limiting the DSSI just um, to be able to deal with a portion of the debt and you're leaving out the private creditors, you're leaving out the multilateral institutions. I don't know how far countries will get with that, quite frankly. 
And um, at the same time, let me say that if you go and check where our international bonds are trading now, they're trading just above par. Um, and, and that is in spite of a pandemic, in spite of an ash fall, which was the worst ash fall from um, in 119 years with volcanic ash traveling 90 miles from St. Vincent and the Grenadines and turning um, day into night and costing us over 1% of GDP and losses in April. And in spite of a hurricane and freak storm that we had at the end of June and the hurricane Elsa at the 2nd of July, which is the worst hurricane we've had in 66 years. And our bonds are still trading at 100.5 last week Friday. So I'm not sure where the, the, the anxiety comes from. Um, and I feel that we need to be far more practical about remembering why we're in government. We're in government to do better for people, not to do better for financial advisors or financial institutions. And perhaps if we remember that, then we will take the right decisions, as Martin said. Thanks very much. Uh, Professor Stiglitz, should we do away with the rating agencies? Uh, I think there needs to be an independent evaluation of uh, the uh, uh, condition of uh, uh, countries. And I want to reemphasize something that was mentioned earlier. There needs to be independent debt sustainability analysis. Uh, because with that independent debt sustainability analysis, it will give confidence to uh, emerging country markets, developing countries to say that debt is not sustainable. And uh, if we bring down the debt level to a sustainable level, then we'll be able to access global capital markets once again. And the experience in Russia and other countries actually shows that uh, once you bring down debt to sustainable levels, uh, it is actually very good for the country. Obviously, the creditors uh, are trying to engage in as much squeezing of the country as possible. That's not a surprise. But the international community has to get together to say, let's balance the power here and uh, let's uh, uh, give the countries, developing countries, the, the, the debtor countries, as uh, much uh, ammunition as they can to combat the uh, misrepresentations uh, and the asymmetries of information that uh, Minister Guzman talked about uh, that uh, occur under the current framework. Okay, Professor Stiglitz, thank you very much indeed. Um, an awful lot we could still run, uh, go over from uh, what we've been talking about so far this afternoon. We do have more questions coming in, but I'm afraid if I'm being told we've, we've run out of time, we're about to go over our allotted slot. But I would just like to come, each, come back to each of you very briefly for some very brief, please, closing remarks. And perhaps uh, you could say, each of you say some words about uh, how you think, uh, the ro what role you think UNCTAD might play as we come forward and hopefully out of the crisis. Prime Minister Motley. Thank you very much. Um, it's actually an appropriate question. Rebecca and I met yesterday to set out some of the work that we want to do. As I said, this whole notion of what constitutes safe assets that leads to a disparity in borrowing costs between countries that have the same credit rating by the international credit agencies, but are paying distinctly different amounts of interest um, for the same amount of money. So we want to look at that as well as what is a sustainable debt anchor. We also want to be able to ensure that our voices, since last year we knew the DSSA was insufficient and would not meet the needs of not, first of all, they wouldn't meet the needs of middle income countries at all. And then secondly, they wouldn't meet the needs sufficiently of low income countries. And when you consider that of the money that was printed, $20 trillion in expanded money supply, and 19 trillion of that went to a few advanced economies, um, you just said that very little of the DSSA has been used, we've heard. But at the same time, in the middle, middle income countries have been left to flounder. And I keep making the point that we need to be able to have a new look at the whole issue of debt 
and this SG call of the UN called for it again on Monday. We support that, but we go even further on some of the issues that I hope UNCTAD can help us with, with the technical work, particularly the safe assets um, and redefining, and, and to explain why is it that Africa, the Caribbean, and the Latin America continue to borrow at these horrendously higher rates. Over to you then, Minister Guzman. What would you, what would you like from uh, UNCTAD in this? Thank you, Jonathan. Well, the UNPA has been doing uh, remarkable work uh, when it comes to that issues, and it, it is uniquely positioned to uh, carry forward uh, more of that technical work, and, and in particular to, to establish uh, an independent uh, uh, debt sustainability analysis, a framework for debt sustainability analysis that, that helps to, to restore the balance of power uh, uh, and views in the negotiations. Uh, and Argentina certainly uh, supports a, a clear mandate for UNCTAD to, to play this role. Professor Stiglitz, a few words from you on what UNCTAD should be doing now. I think uh, I want to echo the point that it has an important role in representing the voice of the developing countries and emerging markets. Uh, a few years ago, uh, there was a lot of discussion about a development round of trade. Uh, a few years ago, there was a, a lot of discussion about a development round, uh, a development-oriented intellectual property regime. Uh, we haven't had either of those. Neither of those have been brought to fruition. So we need the voice of UNCTAD to explain why the rules of the game in trade, in intellectual property, in debt, in climate change, uh, the voice of the developed countries and emerging markets just have to be heard more loudly. As I mentioned before, the same thing that goes uh, in taxes. We're about to have a multilateral agreement about taxes in which it is an agreement done basically at the OECD for and by the advanced countries, leaving uh, the developing countries and emerging markets to get very little out of a new global uh, regime. So I think uh, just hearing the voice of the developing countries and emerging markets in all of these international negotiations, uh, it seems to me uh, really imperative. Thank you very much. Uh, several recurring themes coming out of all of this, uh, and particularly, I think, as Professor Stiglitz was saying, the the need for a more concerted voice uh, from uh, developing countries. Uh, the word bullying was used earlier on, but uh, perhaps there is, you know, there is a structure needed to enable uh, those countries to get their voices across. And UNCTAD, maybe it's it's over to you to be able to deliver that. Uh, we could go on all afternoon. That's been absolutely fascinating. There's a, an awful lot of thought-provoking suggestions and comments and ideas come out of that. I'd like to thank all our panelists for taking part. It's been, uh, as always in, in these occasions, I've learned an awful lot. So it's been great for me, but I hope it's been of interest to the audience as well. Thank you all for watching. Thank you for those of you who sent in questions. Very sorry we didn't have time to get to those. But uh, it has been a fascinating afternoon, so thank you all very much. And that concludes our panel. Goodbye.